Well, Robert, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much for agreeing to do this interview. You've obviously done an extraordinary number of fascinating things across the course of your career, and uh, any one of them would be subject for uh, a much longer interview. But we will focus this one on your latest book, A New Science of Heaven. And this is all about a fourth state of matter called plasma. And this is out of physics. It's not metaphysics. It's not um, uh, occult in any way. But you seem to see that it has an enormous importance and significance for us. So begin with, what is plasma? Well, plasma, as you just mentioned, is indeed a fourth state of matter. It was uh, officially discovered in 1879 by a, an English scientist called Sir William Crookes, who was the inventor of the vacuum tube. And he was playing around with his vacuum tubes and he discovered this phenomenon going on in his tubes and he, he named it radiant matter. The name was changed in 1928 by Irving Langmuir to plasma. And I must uh, stress that it's no connection whatsoever with blood plasma, which is familiar to nurses and doctors and some patients. So plasma is basically uh, a form of matter that's not made of atoms. It's made of particles. Electrons and protons, which are of opposite charge to one another, and ions. Ions are often considered incomplete atoms because they don't have a balanced charge. In fact, I look at it the other way around. I look at atoms as value-added ions. So ions can have positive or negative charge, but we're really only concerned with positively charged ions, which are the most common and which compose, for instance, the solar wind that blows out from the sun and fills the solar system. And so plasma is thus um, something which, when it was originally encountered, appeared to be only a gas. We now know that it can be a liquid and it can not only be a solid, it can be crystals. So for some years now, uh, the, the few scientists who work on the fringes of physics and, and deal with these things have been um, the dealing with uh, plasma crystals. and. There are hot, cold, hot plasmas and cold plasmas. Most of the work that's taking place at the moment is on the hot ones because those are concerned with um, trying to control uh, nuclear fusion to, to make energy. They haven't succeeded in doing that. The plasmas that I'm most concerned about in my book are the space plasmas and they tend to be cold plasmas. When um, you speak of cold plasmas, what temperatures are you talking about? Oh, much colder than anything on Earth, what we used to call outer space. I should point out that um, until 1962, it was universally believed by um, the world's uh, scientific establishment that outer space was empty and it was a perfect vacuum. That may sound incredible now to younger people, but those of us of a certain age, uh, and I think you're younger than I am, but you probably remember, um, we, we grew up as children being told outer space was this uh, total vacuum and nothingness. And we now know that it's actually the very opposite. How does this new discovery of plasma change our understanding of the universe? Where is this leading us? Well, it, it changes it completely because the universe is now known by astrophysicists uh, to be composed of 99.9% .9 plasma. For instance, our sun is completely made of plasma. It's not made of atoms. And we have a universe which is made of plasma, not of at atomic matter. And so uh, we have to face the fact that our basic physics, classical physics, has been left far behind already by relativity theory and quantum theory. 
but um, even the what we consider today to be advanced in modern physics is really wholly inadequate because it's based upon the assumption that the universe is made of atoms and it's not. It's made of plasma, which is very different and behaves very differently from atomic or physical matter, as we call it. And uh, the equations which govern its behavior are all nonlinear equations, which are um, hard to deal with. And uh, it just doesn't follow all of our customary laws. It, it won't uh, sit and obey like a good dog. In fact, it's a big black barking, threatening dog called the universe. And it doesn't want to have um, tiny little humans on a rocky planet in the middle of nowhere trying to impose their laws upon it. It won't go on with that. So we have to change our science. We need a new physics. But don't worry, it's already on the way because there are branches of physics at this moment where the new science is being created. It's just that nobody knows about it. We're talking about uh, I'll, I'll say in a moment why some of plasma physics is not publicly known, but there are other branches. There's topological physics, which is very exciting. And there's uh, information physics, which is an extension of IT. Uh, and it's being driven forward by the search for quantum computers. But of course, a lot of that's confidential. You see a lot of these advances are taking place with uh, two different areas who, which have vested interests in keeping it secret. First of all, you've got the commercial motives, which everyone can understand. If you have a corporation and you're um, in possession of some great new idea about how, how to make quantum computers work, you're not going to tell the other companies. There's confidentiality. So all the scientists working on all of this, they've all signed confidentiality agreements and secrecy agreements. Well, we can understand that perfectly because there's hundreds of billions of dollars involved in anybody who's got the new angle. So this may impede the flow of knowledge and certainly uh, lessen public understanding, but there are these commercial imperatives at work. But even stricter than those are the military controls because most of this kind of work is funded by the defense establishment and the security establishment, which is, I suppose, part of the defense establishment. And um, they overclassify everything. They, they're not really interested in the public, they're interested in what they're doing. And so if the public doesn't know what's going on, well, who cares about those stupid morons out there who, who pay their taxes? The fact is that um, it's all gotta be secret because there's always enemies, you know, and uh, we can't say anything because the enemies might know. Uh, you know, I think everybody understands that as well. So what with the military and security um, restrictions and the commercial restrictions, the exciting work going on in these frontiers of physics doesn't have much of a chance to get through to trickle down to us. And that's why I believe that my book is, is unique because I've gone to immense trouble to try to gather this information to the extent that it's possible. And indeed, I went beyond the possible in many instances and boil it down into a book that can be understood by somebody who doesn't know any science at all. As you read the book, I lead you by the hand and I explain everything as I go along. For instance, if you don't know what a semiconductor is, and most people don't, let's face it, I tell you. And if you don't know what superconductivity is, I tell you. And I do it in an easy way. And furthermore, I've done uh, an audio recording of the book myself, which is available from the same publisher. And, um, some of my friends who have got hooked on the book uh, are listening to it and then going to the book and reading it. And, and most people are reading it all twice or listening to it twice, not because it's difficult. They all say they understand it. In fact, they've never said to me that they misunderstand anything that's in the book. It's just that there's so much information that they have to go over it again because everything in the book is new. And 
it just takes a bit of getting used to, that's all. Well, I've read your book, and I would agree with the things you said about it. I did find it very, very uh, comprehensible, and I find most books that attempt to explain advanced science to people uh, somehow lose me, and they probably lose a lot of readers. That certainly wasn't the case with your book. Uh, it certainly, my impression of it personally was that it was overwhelming, not in the sense of difficulty or even in the sense of the amount of material, but the way it transforms our view of what reality is. And, you know, that, if anything, is the hardest thing to grasp in it. What we think of as reality has very little to do with it. We perceive almost no of even physical reality. So that was one thing that uh, was the case with me. Um, how does this affect our understanding of the day-to-day -day world? Well, um, it has the potential to change everything, really. Um, because setting aside the, the situation that we're in at the moment in, in the year, which we call 2022, um, we've got the whole of the future ahead of us. And since I don't believe that anybody can die, much less does die, we obviously leave our physical bodies behind. All theosophists know about that. Um, but as we've got an infinite future ahead of us, we have to get ourselves in shape to face that, and, and we can't do it with our present concepts. This is why I've struggled with all of this myself. You know, <laughs> you've mentioned how difficult it was for you and overwhelming it was for you to not to take it in, but to, to face the consequences of it. Well, I've been going through that agony for years, um, and, and because I knew how overwhelming it was, I tried to lessen the, the challenge by making it as accessible as I possibly could, because we have to realize several key things which are different than what we think. First of all, the predominance of life forms in the universe are bound to be inorganic, not made of atoms. We are the exception in our physical form. There are very few rocky planets made of what we call physical matter uh, con con containing atoms in the universe. Of course, there may be hundreds of billions of them, but that's a mere nothing to the universe. And um, we, we, we need to realize that um, organic beings, which is what we temporarily are in our physical bodies, which I tend to call smart overcoats, our real selves being bioplasma bodies, and that's what leaves the physical body at death and continues its existence on another plane. You could describe it as another plane. Um, we, we need to uh, realize that the intelligences in the universe are, are cosmic, and these plasmas can form dusty complex plasma clouds, which have the capacity to uh, uh, self-organize and by a process which has become known as emergence, uh, develop in intelligence. Now, um, there are um, co complex plasma clouds throughout the universe. We see them everywhere. Every star is a complex plasma, including our own sun. Uh, lightning, by the way, is plasma. The center of a candle flame is plasma. We have plasma in us. Our physical bodies are full of plasma. The flows of currents are plasma. Every cell has proton currents going across the membrane. The, the heart is an electromagnetic uh, device, um, which happens to activate itself as a muscle. But the, the fact is that we already, even in our physical form, are electromagnetic uh, beings. And the core of ourselves is our bioplasma self, which is entirely um, plasma and electromagnetic. The thing about plasma is that it has positive charges and negative charges, and it can contain modules within it, uh, countless ones. So for instance, a, a bioplasma body, the same size as a physical body, 
will have an interior structure far more complex than our physical bodies. And indeed we are uh, very complex uh, bioplasma bodies, which uh, exceed in complexity the well-known anatomy of our physical bodies. Well, that's extraordinary. And um, there are many things uh, I could say, many directions I could take this just from what you've just said. But let's talk about the human body, and uh, go with that direction. Occult theory has long held, there have been all sorts of subtle bodies that are, well, non-physical. Uh, some of these are kind of described as etheric bodies or pranic bodies, astral bodies. There is this seems to be the substance called the life force, uh, you know, which is prana or chi, which science for some reason refuses to admit the existence of. How does plasma relate to some of these concepts? Well, Richard, I'm so glad you mentioned all that because, of course, there have been so many inspired people, psychics, seers, um, and so on, who have intuited all the things which modern science can now demonstrate scientifically at last. And um, it forms the core of theosophy. All these things you mentioned, like um, pranic energy and uh, the subtle bodies, and um, uh, you know, you can look at that wonderful book, The Subtle Body by G.R.S. Mead, which is a classic example. And he's one of my intellectual heroes, by the way. Um, the, the, these things are all true. And I believe that there's more than one level of the bioplasma body, which is why you get the differentiation of the different uh, plasma bodies in, in theosophical uh, writings. But that was known to the ancient Egyptians. You know, they had many different souls. They had the Ka, they had the Ba, and so on. And they had the Ak, the highest one being the Ak. And, um, and so this is the perennial wisdom, you might say. And this is what Madame Blavatsky was trying to institutionalize and give it a bit more fiber um, because it was um, wiggling about too much and she thought she ought to form some centers and, and get it a bit organized, which was a marvelous idea. And um, so to try to get this deep wisdom uh, propagated and uh, preserved and and uh, to get it um, analyzed as well. Because um, all of this perennial wisdom is true. And um, just because it's been mocked and sneered at by uh, people who arrogantly believe themselves to be rationalists, that just means narrow-minded, uh, doesn't mean that it's uh, false. Science has finally uh, begun to catch up with ancient wisdom let's face it, we're getting to the point where on the very fringes of science, unreported to the public, never mentioned in, in, in the media, is all the stuff that I've gathered together in my book, which proves, proves scientifically that all this stuff is true. It's all true. That's why it's so important that we're doing this. Um, and you, Richard, of course, are well, well known in this field yourself. You know, I feel I'm talking to uh, a fellow uh, searcher. We're, we've been on the same path for a long time, even though we've never met. I've never even seen you until today. But we have to get this message out there. The whole Theosophical Society needs to get into gear and without meaning to call attention to myself as the author of this book, that's a kind of compilation. It's like an operating manual. Um, it's it basically at the kindergarten level, let's face it. We're not at the stage yet where we could write anything for the first grade. I'm dealing at the kindergarten level because we don't know enough yet, but we have to get this basic material propagated. We have to tell people because the entire future of the planet really depends on this. Forget CO2 and climate change and all of that. Compared, compared to what we're talking about, that's, um, that's a temporary matter. In fact, it, it, ultimately, it doesn't even matter if the Earth should be destroyed by climate change. The fact is the universe won't be. And we have to think universally. And I don't think the, the planet's going to be destroyed anyway. But the fact is that even if it were, 
we as beings won't be destroyed. The physical planet might be destroyed, our physical bodies might all burn up, or who knows what might happen in that department, but we will continue to exist as bioplasma beings in a plasma world, which cannot be destroyed by climate change because there's no climate in the plasma world. There's no weather, there are no clouds, there's no rain, there's, there's no heat, there's no cold. Uh, and so all those things that everybody's all worried about, just cause, because, you know, what's going to happen to us all here on Earth? W even if everything were to be destroyed on this planet, we would all still exist. And the efforts that we make here and now to understand the universe and come to terms with it and get ourselves into gear properly will continue, even if it only con continues on what's traditionally been called the spiritual level. Well, that's uh, that's excellent. Thank you for your kind words. They're uh, an enormous honor coming from you, and I feel very much the same way about you. And I was very touched when you sent me a copy of your book uh, to go on to explore one ramification of the things you just said. You have pointed out that the ancient Egyptians knew about these subtle bodies, and their teachings about them in most traditions going from the aboriginal to the esoteric religions uh, behind religion. Does that mean that the human has a capacity to somehow, some organ to perceive these subtle bodies in some way? I'm so glad you asked that, Richard. Yes, I do believe that. And the thing is that we live in um, a society today which is intensely materialistic, I would say very decadent, that's my personal opinion about it. And um, it's shut itself off from what is traditionally called the spiritual. Now, I, I don't want my remarks to be taken in any religious context. And that's why I tend not to use the word spiritual in my book, um, because I, I wish to be neutral on the religious side. I don't believe that any religion uh, is disturbed or perturbed in any way by what I'm talking about. Indeed, I would say they're all strengthened. But I don't want to become theological, and um, I leave that to the theologians. And so um, I do believe that every human being has the capacity for um, intuition of the deeper truths if they're sufficiently open. But most people today are being artificially closed by all the, the bad forces like um, the addiction to, um, to the cell phones and, you know, a message coming in, which is going to be a nonsense message, like saying, see you in five minutes kind of thing. And nobody any longer has any reflection time or time alone or time to think or get their head together because there's always information coming in, information overload to the point where you could scream so I don't own and refuse to own a cell phone. And I don't want people phoning me when I'm walking along. You know, I might be thinking. And um, if people want to phone me, I've got plenty of landlines. And I'm often by them. I have an office, I have a home, and so on. Um, we, we need to clear away the information clutter and the, the excessive radiation being beamed at us by all these devices. And, and give ourselves a bit of peace. Now, people who meditate are doing that, of course, and there are lots of meditators about, and that's a good thing. And um, it's not just, however, that we need to set aside time to sit and meditate. We need to make our lives more peaceful if we possibly can. And, and, and so it, when we do that, I believe that we can have the truths come to us because we are surrounded by information space, as I call it. I get a lot of my intuitions from, from my ability to contact and penetrate information space, which you have to work at over many years. And, and ever since I was young, I was able to walk into a library with open shelves and go to the right shelf and reach up to the right book and pull it out, open it to the right page, and there's what I need, because I'm in touch with information space. That's my skill. Other people can go win gold medals in the Olympics, and I think that's wonderful. But we all have our special things we can do, 
And if we stick to it and work at it and really concentrate on that and give it its chance, we can open ourselves. And in ancient times, there was a lot of what, what we could call shamanism going on. The priests and, and, and the seers and the sibyls, they were attempting to draw down from what you could call above um, the, the, the deeper truths and, and to uh, bring the, what you could call the sacred intuitions down into their uh, minds. And, and so I think that there was more of a direct connection to the deeper truths in simpler times. Well, that makes a great deal of sense. Let me go on to something slightly different, because one thing that I found fascinating in your book was the uh, plasma clouds that you described between the Earth and the Moon. Could you explain those a little bit? Yes, that's pretty important because um, we have SETI programs looking for little green men in outer space because we want extraterrestrial intelligence. And in fact, I'm convinced we have it right on our doorstep. These two giant clouds, which together are 18 times the size of the Earth, are between the Earth and the Moon, but not in a direct line of sight between the Earth and the Moon. They're at, at 60 degree angles to the left and to the right as you look towards the Moon. Now, they are at what's called the Lagrange points, L4 and L5. What are the Lagrange points? Well, Lagrange was an Italian called Lagrange, yeah. And uh, then he was called Lagrange by the French and we call him Lagrange. So he was a famous scientist and we've named these points after him as many things are named after famous scientists, but they're often just called L for short. And they are points between bodies in space where the gravitational pull of those bodies is effectively neutralized. So L4 and L5 are the two spots where the gravitational pull of the moon and the gravitational pull of the earth balance out and there's nothing pulling you anywhere. You can just sit there. These points have been known for a long time. I used to be a member long ago of something called the L5 Society. My very great friend who died much too young of leukemia was um, Professor Jerry O'Neill who um, wrote a book called The High, um, the High Frontier. Uh, about space colonies, and he uh, he was a Princeton physics professor, and he um, founded the Space Studies Institute, and he wanted to get a, a space colony at L5, not knowing, of course, that it had the cloud there, because that wasn't known to him. And um, there was this uh, space enthusiast society called the L5 Society, which for some reason, it, it, its headquarters in Arizona, and um, it had a lot of members and it had a newsletter and I was a member of that. That goes way back to the seventies. And um, cause you know, I'm not a 20 something anymore. So I've been around for a while and I was involved in space for a while. Um, I had, I made a very, very, very important uh, contribution to uh, the space industry, which um, I haven't ever discussed. And I also organized a, a conference of international heads of space stations. And I, I was very active, but that was then and this is now. So the um, L4 and L5 points, which have no gravitation, are where these clouds are. Now, they were first discovered in 1961 by a Polish observational astronomer called Kordelewski. That's K-O-R-D-Y, Kordy Lewski. L-E-W-S-K-I, and because the Poles pronounce a W like a V in the same way that we say Wagner in German, Kordelewski. And they're known as the Kordelewski clouds because he discovered them. Now, they don't emit any light and they're tra almost transparent, almost entirely transparent, very difficult to detect. But they're, as I say, uh, 18 times the size of the earth together. In other words, nine times the size of the earth each and they're between us and the moon. Now they are dusty complex plasmas of gigantic size, just imagine. They were finally confirmed in 2019 by a team of Hungarian astronomers um, who were able to prove their existence, which Kordelewski couldn't do in 1961 for two reasons. One, he didn't have the uh, modern equipment at that stage. And the other thing is that as his great grandson has told me, 
um, the Polish um, communist government didn't like him and stopped his work, which was a source of great frustration to the poor guy. And of course, we have politics interfering with science all the time, don't we? Everywhere, in every country, for all different reasons. So, um, but anyway, the Hungarians came charging in on their white horses to the rescue, and they proved that he was right, and they proved the existence of the clouds. I discovered this quite soon and uh, contacted, because on researchgate.net, which is where a lot of my more technical papers are posted, I, uh, I, I found the Hungarian scientists there and I got onto them. There's a woman who's in charge of them. And, um, and I said to her, are you studying the plasma aspects of the cloud? And she said, no, we're only studying the celestial mechanics aspects. So I thought, well, I've got to do something about this quick. So I got onto my great friend, whom I've known forever, uh, Professor Chandra Vikramasinghe, who was the, the main protege of uh, Fred Hoyle, who, whom I knew very well, and um, with whom he wrote many joint books. And so I said to Chandra, look, um, he didn't know about these Kordaleski clouds. Very few people did. And I told him what they were, and I said that these are giant, um, dusty complex plasmas uh, of fantastic size and they're in, in, very near us and we, we have to do a paper. Would you do it with me? Because he knows how to do all the equations and everything. And so, um, and he is a professor of astrophysics. Uh, he's been doing this all his life, which I have not. And so um, you know, I started out studying Sanskrit, which is a little bit uh, offbeat. And so um, we did a paper together, which was in uh, Advances in Astrophysics, and it's reprinted as an appendix to my book. Um, I didn't read it on the audio book, I, I hasten to say, it was too technical for that, but it's there as an appendix in the book. And um, we called attention to the fact that uh, dusty complex plasmas in space like this would uh, almost um, certainly have evolved intelligence and considering that they're probably billions of years old, um, they would have um, intelligence uh, so great that they would know everything about everything that's going on in the earth. They would know all about everybody. They would uh, shamelessly uh, dwarf the pretenses of the American security establishment with their supercomputers in Utah or wherever they are where they store every phone call, every email, and all that nonsense that they do, which they think is going to make them all wise, but of course they, they can't process all that. Whereas these clouds can process everything, I believe they're conscious, they're alive. And furthermore, I believe even they were intuited in antiquity because uh, in Gnostic Christianity, especially among the, um, the Marcosians, um, there's very little that survives, but this is referred to by Epiphanius and some of the heresiologists and, um, and, and um, there are descriptions that do survive of gigantic entities above the atmosphere, between the, atm between the earth and the moon, which are mo monstrously large uh, being, intelligent beings, um, one of whom was called Metatron, which is the Samaritan name for the angel of the Lord, who's mentioned in the story of Moses in the Bible. You see how ancient all this is. And they believed that um, they were super entities presiding over the earth. And so the fact that we now have scientific proof, not only that the Kordaleski clouds exist, we know where they are, um, and we know their size. And I, I was the one who initiated trying to get to grips with the plasma implications of them because the Hungarian astronomers didn't appear to know much about plasma. They were observational astronomers. And I, th I got the impression that the woman didn't even know what I was really asking when I said, are you dealing with the plasma aspects of the clouds? That's why we went on record, Chandra and I, to get this going in the scientific community and although only about 550 people have so far downloaded the paper, that's more than zero. We're getting the, the information out there, but it's, it's a big stretch, you see. 
to realize that we may have extra intelligent life between us and the moon. It's just inorganic. And it would be like super AI, if you can imagine that. We don't know whether they would have things like emotions and feelings. Uh, maybe they do. But what they would have would be fantastic, unimaginable computing power. They would know everything about the history of the Earth and everything on it for its entire history. And they probably got great future predictors. You know, they would have the best models. They're probably going to be able to tell us what's going to happen six months from now. And they probably, they know everything's going on that those entities would be recording what we're doing right now, for instance. They're probably glad to be noticed. I do, I do believe that they've attempted to communicate with us and that we didn't notice. I, I had a whole section of the book about that, which was removed by the publishers. So I'll have to publish that at some point. There is a history of their attempts to communicate with us. Well, that's another, another story. We have enough to go on with at the moment. Now, how, how can we communicate with these giant entities, which are 18 times the size of the earth? And we know that they're gonna be quite different from us. If they're not just big, they're different. And they're not necessarily gonna look at things the way we do, because here we are on planet earth, which is this small rocky planet, you know, and we've got our affairs that, that take up all of our time every day. We've got world affairs, we've got personal affairs. We have things like um, earning money to get the food to eat and uh, to pay the rent. And, uh, you know, we're quite preoccupied as it is with what's called daily life. And then there are the diplomats and the politicians and, and, and the, the, uh, the armies and all the stuff going on in, in what we call the world. And, you know, we have a lot to worry about as it is, but now this is so big that the, the security agencies will consider this the, as they already consider the whole question of extraterrestrial life as the number one security issue for the world. Well, it is, it is. Now, so we come to the question, are the clouds friendly uh, or do they hate us? Well, I think the answer to that is very plain. If they weren't friendly, we wouldn't be here. I believe that they're just hoping we'll make it, you know, and they keep trying to help us um, by sending down um, um, waves of thought or whatever that sensitives can pick up. Uh, but what can they do? They can't sort of decloud themselves and come down and, and say, look, uh, we're gonna sort out um, your politics for you and we're gonna stop wars and so on. I mean, basically we're in charge of our own planet, but they must be quite worried about what we're gonna do with the planet. And I'm convinced that they want us to make it because they must want us to enter into communication with them in a meaningful way. But on the other hand, they don't want to make us feel inferior because they're so big and they're so clever. And we're such stupid dolts down here on earth who merely have uh, ordinary human intelligence. Um, and in other words, they don't want to demoralize us that would be fatal because then we just sort of internally collapse in, in, in terms of our motivations. But what can they do? Um, we, we need to work all this out. This is big. This is the future of, of the human species. This is the future of our world. This is the future of the planet. This is, this is the big one. And if we don't begin to start thinking about this, my book is an attempt to just get us started. We've got to really get to grips with this. This is the future of everything. I, I hope I'm not overstating the case, but, and I, I, I don't want to call a lot of attention to myself because I, I, I'm not that kind of person. Um, and um, I, I don't want to um, be rich and famous, which is the big American dream. Um, I just want, to get this dialogue started, really. It's so important. There's nothing more important, in my opinion. Uh, I may be wrong, of course. Well, uh, one question that comes up is, how do we know that these plasma clouds are intelligent? 
Well, that's um, something which, having read the book, you will have seen that um, there's been a lot of work done, mostly by Russian scientists, which makes it all the more awkward that we can't communicate with our Russian scientist friends at the moment, because if they got an email from a Westerner, they might be shot or something by the crazy Putin. And, and so, but the, um, Sitovich, who's no longer alive, so can't be shot, um, was the leading scientist of the group of uh, scientists, which contained a number of Russians who actually live abroad, some in Germany, for instance, and some in America, um, none in Britain, unfortunately, um, who had worked out, and it's all laid out in the book, um, that by process, spontaneous processes of self-organization, when these clouds come together, they, they can um, generate by this buzz phrase, emergence, um, intelligence, which then becomes more and more intelligent and keeps growing. And if they're billions of years old, you can't even begin to imagine how intelligent they are. But um, th we now know how this happens. And at the, at the latter part of the book, as you know, I get into information science and that kind of thing. And I talk about the difference between passive information and active information. And my old friend, David Bohm, the physicist, um, towards the end of his life, um, he was focused on, on information at, at being more important than the mass and energy. And I believe that information can um, break the light barrier because information doesn't have any mass. And as it's not mass, it, it, it has no mass and it has no energy, and therefore, it shouldn't be restricted by the speed of light. It, it could be possible for instantaneous telepathic transmission of information across any distance and across any time because it doesn't have any mass or energy. But uh, um, you see, one could go on and write many more books and many sequels and go on. And if I were in my 20s, I'd probably write a whole series of books. But um, I'm just trying to get the, this discussion started. And um, we, uh, it is certain now that uh, dusty complex plasmas, and that's a specific type of plasma, you have to have dust or it doesn't work. And it was Gary Selwyn in eight, 1989, good old Gary, who was working for, for IBM then, they used plasmas to deposit circuits onto microchips and nanochips. And he was trying to find out how to get rid of the dust that kept coming. And he was the one who discovered that plasma makes its own dust. It manufactures its own dust. I know that sounds pretty strange, but he discovered that and he's a big hero as in fact, I told him he didn't know because he's left plasma science. And nobody bothered to tell him until I came along and said, Gary, do you realize what you did? Um, you're the one who proved that plasma makes its own dust. This is why they kept getting dust in all the tokamaks, which are trying to generate energy by controlled fusion. And they were wearing all these um, white coats and things and they in these uh, clean rooms and whatever, because they thought it was dirt or contamination getting in. We now know that plasmas make their own dust and you can't get rid of the dust in a reactor, you see, because Plasma makes it just, but it does that for its own reasons because it uses the dust uh, in the way that uh, um, physical matter uses atoms. And so um, basically dusty complex plasmas, which are, as I say, a very special kind of plasma, the kind of plasma that becomes intelligent has to have its dust. And if it hasn't got any sitting around and that it can gather up, it'll make its own. It's um, self-sufficient in a way, but it does need energy coming in. And of course, our Kordaleski clouds um, eat um, the energy that's coming from the sun. Extraordinary. To go back to uh, a progress or non-progress or awakening or non-awakening of the human race, you suggest, as many people have, there are forces <laughs> that are very much interested in our awakening. And yet there seems to be all sorts of factors that resist, impede, uh, uh, sub, um, subvert these uh, efforts of illumination. It would be, it almost seems as if there's one 
uh, group out there that is trying to enlighten us and another group that is sort of trying to put the uh, lid on us. Uh, uh, does, yeah. does this make any sense to you? Is this, is oh, yeah. Really oh, yeah. Well, I think there's a war between good and evil going on throughout the universe. And um, we're in the crossfire. I mean, let's face it, we live in a world today where authoritarianism is spreading rapidly everywhere. And we've got all these horrible people. I won't mention any names or any political parties or any governments, really. But well, let's call them horrible people who are trying to enslave humanity because they believe themselves to be elite and they want to control this planet. Uh, they're all insane. I, I consider them all to be psychopaths. And um, unfortunately, this brings us to a discussion of humanity in the large. Um, I think that uh, humans are subjects of very special interest to the higher entities. You can imagine there must be lots of other physical species in the universe who are incredibly dull, but very good. And then there would be others who are incredibly violent and uh, not good at all, just, just wholly bad. And, and we're kind of uh, a mixture. And I believe that we are of great interest to the cosmic anthropologists because we're a strange uh, uh, kind of experiment of the, the borderline between madness and creativity. Um, we, you see, we are uniquely able to be creative. It's quite fantastic, the amount of uh, almost unbelievably sublime music that can come from human beings. Look at Bach and Mozart, and I could name them all. But the fact is that um, we write brilliant novels, we make brilliant films, we, um, we paint brilliant pictures. We're amazingly creative. And where does all this come from? And at the same time, a lot of the intensely creative people are pretty wild and woolly characters and a bit crazy. And, uh, uh, and, and there's this thin line between genius and madness. And you get the, the, the super mathematicians, a lot of whom are, uh, you know, autistic. And we don't know what this all means, but we're a tremendously interesting species to study. Because when you consider all those other species out there who must be so boring, we're not boring. We don't do boring. But we're also um, loaded with psychopaths. I would say at least 10% of humanity are psychopathic. It, some people would say 20%. And um, the thing is that they're obsessed with control. So they want to control everything and they've got all the energy. They're prepared to devote their lives to getting control just for the control's sake. They don't want to use it for the good. They want to glorify themselves because they're, they're megalomaniacs, they're, they're, psych they're psychopaths. They are the embodiment of the forces of bad who are trying to suppress the rest of us who, who really are not bad people. I mean, we all have faults. We've all done bad things, I'm sure. Um, uh, some of us have done fewer bad things than others. We, we do need, know some saintly people uh, who appear never have done a bad thing or had a bad thought. I mean, I've known several like that. And, um, and yet we're all being run over all the time by the, the huge monstrous tires of these, um, these vehicles run by the psychopaths who want to take over the world and no matter how hard we try to vote them out of office or, or have uh, velvet revolutions in the streets or whatever it is that we try and do, can never seem to quite get rid of all the psychopaths. What the higher entities want to know is can this work? In other words, can they somehow come up with a model of a human species that isn't quite as crazy as we are, but still retains the creativity? Or do they have to, do we have to be this crazy in order to be this creative? Uh, no, uh, we don't know the answer to that question. And I bet they don't either because we're a running experiment. Uh, they are really interested to see whether the human thing can work. I mean, they want it to work because they'd like to replicate it throughout the universe. 
we may be really uh, a very rare type of species of, uh, in terms of our physical existence in this galaxy. Well, I'm not sure you're familiar with this book. Most important study I've read of the psychopaths is called uh, Political Ponderology, written by a pole under the Iron Curtain or a, a group of poles in Iron Curtain times. But ponderology comes from the Greek poneros, meaning wicked. And oh, it's, it's a study of exactly the people you're talking about. It explores what you're talking about very intelligently and unfortunately frighteningly. Yeah. But uh, to go on, I think uh, time is moving on, but I would like to ask um, one last question. And it uh, was raised by something Fred Hoyle said in, uh, that you quoted which is that the scientific peer review process is merely a retardation of the advancement of knowledge. Uh, do you agree yeah. with that? And could you uh, expound on that a little? Yes. Well, as you know from, from my book, I, I give case histories of uh, scientists who've made crucial experiments who have been prevented from publishing. Uh, Fritz Zwicky, this Swiss astronomer, is, is, is a leading case because um, in the late 40s um, and all through the 50s, he, he kept trying to uh, publish his paper that he had found evidence that outer space was not empty. Uh, and, and of course the establishment um, uh, insisted that it was empty, as I said earlier, that it was a vacuum. And he had this evidence. And now there are also f bad forces who don't want us to know this. That they have their own agendas for wanting to keep us in as much ignorance as possible. So Zwicky couldn't get his paper published for 10 years. He went to every physical and astrophysical journal in the world. They all said no, they, they refused to publish this, this evidence that outer space was not empty. And um, the head of his own observatory wrote to the journal editors and said, whatever you do, don't publish Zwicky's paper. And of course he behaved illegally, but he was never held to account. So finally Zwicky went to a biology journal, a biology journal to publish an astronomical article. It was in a peer reviewed, <laughs> a peer reviewed biology journal. And this meant that it was published and he could have off prints from the publication, which he could then send to all the astronomers. And it took him 10 years to get around the blockage now, this is an example of how uh, the advancement of knowledge is held back, not just by the peer review process, which is, is almost continually abused, but by the knowledge control freaks. They don't want, first of all, the establishment doesn't want to be shown to be wrong because people would lose face and, and their reputations would be damaged. They want to always be correct and they want to be the ones, you see the wise ones. And so if you come up with anything that goes against what they've already said, they'll try and stop you for just egotistic reason, reasons. But um, the, the whole peer review process is to maintain the status quo of science and to prevent advances and to prevent anything that challenges the establishment. That's what it's for. It, it, it pretends to be uh, to keep false science from being published well. You know, editors have got their heads screwed on straight. They're not going to be publishing false science. And um, it's only a lot of this so-called false science is like Fritz Zwicky's discoveries. It's false because you say it's false, but it's not false, it's true. And yes, I agree with you, Richard. The peer review process, just as Fred said, because he experienced this with the horrible John Maddox at Nature magazine, and I know all about all the details of that, um, could not get certain important discoveries published. And, and it happens to everybody. My book is full of the terrible stories of suppression and, and the name calling and, and the vilification and the insults and my friend Peter Mitchell, who finally discovered um, the um, the proton currents going across the membranes in cell biology, and he was he revolutionized bioenergetics for twenty years. He was called insane. My friend Rupert Sheldrake said when he was a student at Cambridge, he the the lecturers would say, "Now, 
when you're studying the subject, you may come across papers by a man called Peter Mitchell. Do not read them. He is totally insane, and we don't read him. Rupert remembered that from his uh, Cambridge days. And, and so Peter Mitchell finally proved that he was right. And, and he got the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1978. Because he was right, and he proved it. And then a lot of the people who had spent 20 years insulting him and calling him a madman came up to him and said, oh, Peter, congratulations, we always knew you were right. <laughs> you know, the bloody hypocrites. And um, a lot of scientists, unfortunately, they're human, um, <laughs> have deeply human faults, and egotism is one of the worst of them. And... Um, <sighs> My book is full of the sad stories of the heroes of plasma science who have fought against all the odds to create plasma science to get us to where we are now, which is just the beginning. And they fought against so many obstacles. I don't know how, you know, God, how did they stand it? Albert St. Georgie, whom I, I only met one, once for an afternoon's conversation, um, was a great hero, but he was persecuted by the... Uh, this terrible man, Ferenc Volgesi, the Hungarian hypnotist who hypnotized 60,000 Jews in the concentration camps and was then brought to America and called Frank and he was the head of the mind control program of the CIA. Talk about psychopaths. Oh, and uh, even to this day, his name has been suppressed. I'll spell it for you. V-O-L-G-Y. E-S-I, Volgesi, it's a strange Hungarian name. And um, remember that name because he ruined many lives. He was the world's most brilliant hypnotist. He was Hitler's hi hypnotist after all. He, you know, people talk about Hannesen, who was murdered by the Nazis in the end when they discovered that he was a Jew um, and he knew too much. He's considered Hitler's, Hitler's hypnotist, but the real one was Volgesi, and uh, who worked for Himmler, and um, you know that story's never come out. So many stories never come out, Richard, and um, I don't want to have to be the one to have to tell all this stuff. You know, I would rather get on with things quietly, but you come up against the psychopaths every which way you turn. You know, I, I've had trouble with them since the 1970s. I could, I could talk for hours about the things they've done to me, but I don't wish to claim victimhood, which is so fashionable these days. And I, I just get on with things and I expect all this. I expect to be attacked. I expect to be insulted. I expect to be ignored. And in fact, that <laughs> means I'm on the right track.